the Yugo is considered by many as the worst car ever, but most of them don't take into consideration the story behind the car or the brand, and this is something that sadly nowadays happen with many cars. But anyways, hello guys and welcome back to another video and here is the story of Yugo. The story of Zastava begins in 1853 when they started producing their first firearms. They had been around for some time but only as a foundry. Just that there were some things to point out. First was that the foundry at the time was called Topolivnica. The second was that the factory was ruled by the crown family of Serbia. The factory would play a major role on the development of Serbia and was the first factory to be electrified in the country. At the end of the century, the foundry was renamed Vojotechnici Zavod. The first involvement of Zastava with cars would come in the early 1900s, when they would create a division to service different cars. Also, they would manufacture car parts around this time. Since they were a firearm manufacturer in the first place, the equipment was sized by the German and Austro-Hungarian troops, who occupied Kragujevets. But thanks to the Treaty of Versailles, the factory was rebuilt with new equipment. The real involvement of Zastava with cars would only come in 1930s, when they would manufacture a batch of 250 Chevrolet trucks for the Yugoslavian army. But this would not last for long, since in April 1941, German troops entered the city and once again all the equipment was sized and sent to Germany. The work on the factory would only start in 1945, one year after the city was liberated from the Germans. The plant was in a really bad shape, so they were only doing minor works, like repairing trucks which were left behind by the Germans and the Soviets. In 1945, Zastava name would appear for the first time when the factory was renamed Zverna Zastava. In 1948, the Minister of Agriculture of Yugoslavia proposed a study on the possibility of producing cars at the plant of Kragujevets. Soon the report was ready, but the idea wasn't approved. But five years later, the leadership positions had changed and the assembly of the cars begin of the plants, now called Zavodi Zverna Sastava, or the Red Flag Factories. In 1953, thanks to a partnership with the American government, 12 wheelies overland were sent to the Zastava plant to be assembled since they came as kids. But the Americans weren't interested on a, on a long-term partnership, so the deal ended here. And so Zastava started looking for a new partner that would license them a SUV that they could build in Yugoslavia. This would be much cheaper, plus Zastava didn't have enough engineers to develop a car from the ground up. A number of car makers showed interest, car makers such as Renault, De La Haye, Fiat, Alfa Romeo, Rover and Austin. Even Willis showed interest for the military vehicles. But the winner was Fiat, which didn't have the best car, but they asked the lowest amount of money for the license. Thanks to some further negotiation, Fiat decided not only to license the military SUV, which would be based on the Campagnola, but also on license the 1400 series and were also going to help with trucks and tractors. All these cars would be copies of the original ones, just that would carry the Zastava badge, in similar fashion with some of the Soviet cars. But being a socialist communist state, people of Yugoslavia were far from being rich, so no one could really afford these cars. For this reason, Zastava turned again to Fiat, this time asking for the license of the 600, which like its little brother was a huge success, thanks to the cheap price. The first cars came from Italy as kids and were assembled in Yugoslavia. The real production began in 1958. The plant began to produce chassis and the bodies at its own facilities. 
One year later the production of events and trucks based on the 1100 series began. Like all the other cars, these were copies of Fiat's. In 1961 the production of the new model 1300 and 5000 began, and by 1962 a new factory was built. This was a more modern factory than the old one. The factory had a maximum capacity of 18,000 cars per year. In 1968, Zastava and Fiat signed a new contract, according to which Italians promised to take part in further development of the Yugoslavian enterprise. In 1971, Zastava be began the production of the 128, which was based on the Fiat with the same name. This was a quite innovative car, since this was the first front-wheel drive car built by Fiat. Also, the car had a number of modern features. The original plan was to license the Fiat 124, but Zastava didn't want so, since the Soviet Union had already started the production of the Vaz 2101, which was a copy of the 124. All the cars at this point were basically rebadged Fiat's, maybe with uh, some small changes here and there like headlights and bumpers. But in 1971 would come probably what can be considered as the first original Zastava. And this was the 101, or the Scala, how the car is known domestically. Underneath the 101 was a Fiat 128, but was the body that made the, qu the car quite special. Arriving a full three years before Fiat's own 128 3P and Volkswagen's Golf, the 101 was among the first front-wheel drive hatchbacks. The body was originally designed for Fiat, but the design wasn't approved by Fiat and so Zastava took hold of it. The early 70s would also bring another big change, and this would be the western market. Originally, they would start to sell cars in their neighbor countries, like Greece, but in 1973, a French businessman who sold Fiat's and Autobiakis in France also started importing Zastavas. One of the most interesting things is that Zastava faced the same problem as Porsche when they started selling the 101 in France, since Peugeot had bought all the names with a zero in the middle, so they had to change the name of the car to 1100. Wanted to prove the reliability of their cars, Zastava decided to take part on a 14,000 marathon in 1973. They entered with uh, two 101s on a marathon that went across Europe. They also had to go against major European brands like Renault, Simca, Alfa Romeo, BMW, Audi, Opel, Porsche and also newcomers from Japan like Toyota and Datsun were part of the marathon. Surprisingly, even for Zastava, the team managed to finish on a fourth place overall, and first on its class. This wasn't bad at all since the original goal was just to finish the race, but Zastava wanted to do more, and so they decided to have an advertising campaign, when they had to complete a 40-day tour that went through Greece, Egypt, Sudan, Kenya, Uganda and Tanzania. Five teams were prepared for this amazing journey, and again Zastava's proved to be extremely reliable, with all five cars finishing the marathon. Until this point, Zastava had been a semi-successful, since their cars were extremely cheap, they were quite popular in the Eastern Bloc, but they were also popular among young people in Western countries. But with prices getting lower and lower and with the production numbers, Getting higher, the production quality started getting kind of worse, with certain models getting parts from other models. But this was only the beginning since there was still way more to come. In 1978 a new model was being designed under the name 102. This would be the second real Zastava after the 101. And like the 101, the car was originally designed for Fiat but the design was considered too dated for the tour in brand, so the Stava again took hold of it. The 102 would share the same platform with the 127, but this was all, since the rest was made by Zastava. 
like the 101 the name had to be changed. And here is where the Yugo name uh, appears for the first time. The name choice is quite interesting. In fact, the name had nothing to do with Yugoslavia. Yugo is the south wind on the Adriatic Sea, which in the Italian version is called Scirocco. Zastava decided to follow Volkswagen by naming the model in honor of winds, like Passat, Scirocco and Golf. Meanwhile, the rest of the, of the lineup was receiving updates, like new bumpers and headlights. But the Yugo would quickly become the main car of the brand. The Yugo started hitting dealers in the early 80s, and by 1983 the car was also being sold in the western markets, with quite good numbers. And the main reason for this was without a doubt the price. The Yugo 45 was the cheapest car on the market. For example, a Ford Fiesta had a price of £4,100. The Yugo 2700 pounds. Still, at this point, not many people knew about Yugo, but everything would change the day that Malcolm Bricklin saw one of the streets of London. Bricklin was an American businessman, mostly known for his imports like Subaru and some Fiat models, and also for his car venture Bricklin SV1. Malcolm saw on of the small Yugoslavian car and wanted to sell the car in the States. And this would be done by the help of another businessman who also saw potential on the Yugo. And, but that's a story for another time. So guys, thank you for watching and see you next time.